I recently read Verity by Colleen Hoover. It is the first and only Coho book I've ever read, and I got some things to say about it. But before we get going, there will be spoilers in here. I will mark clearly when I start to talk about spoilers. Um, and also, if you like the format of this video and you kind of like hanging out with me and listening to me talk about books, like and subscribe to the channel, like the video, subscribe to the channel. Um, it really helps me out, so thanks so much for taking the time to do it. All right, into the book. So the book's back cover tells us that an author has been hired to basically fill in the last few uh, books in a series for an author that has had some kind of illness or accident um, and isn't able to finish the series. And, and the main character uh, has been chosen to go and fill in for her, right? Like as a co-writing sort of thing. Um, and all of this woman's notes are in her office in this grand mansion that she lives in with her husband and her son. When the author gets there, she discovers that the original author is completely immobile. Um, she can't function, she can't do anything, and then weird stuff starts happening around the house. And the main character starts to question what's real and what's just in her imagination. And oh, by the way, she's developing feelings for this woman's husband. So that's the premise of the book, right? And here's where we're going to start to get into spoilers, because I'm going to talk about some of the details of the plot that kind of worked for me and some of the ones that didn't. Um, so we open the book with this gruesome scene where she's standing on the curb waiting to cross the street to go to a meeting, um, and a guy gets hit by a car and his head gets crushed under a tire, and it, she uses the phrase popped like a grape. Um, that guy, that like really graphic gruesome opening scene, he never gets mentioned again. There is no trauma associated with having witnessed this horrible accident. Um, she just kind of walks off and goes to her meeting, and it's it's a really bizarre way to open a book. Um, I don't know much about Colleen Hoover because I don't read Colleen Hoover books. I don't watch or read a lot of Colleen Hoover reviews. Um, I am aware that she is known for uh, writing either really graphic or really intense scenes that don't really go anywhere. So I guess this is just kind of her thing. Um, it's not It's not my preferred way to open a book. Generally, if you're going to have a big graphic scene in the beginning, you want it to tie into the rest. Whatever she's doing, it seems to be working for her, so who am I to critique how she chooses to open her books? Okay, so guy gets crushed by a tire, the chick who witnesses it, that happens literally right in front of her, she just walks off. No no filing police reports or anything. She's just the uh, she's just gonna bug her off. There's plenty of other witnesses, she thinks. Um and uh so she goes into this bathroom in a cafe and a guy kind of follows her in. I can't remember if they met on the curb. I think they met on the curb and he's like, here, come here, come in this bathroom. You're covered in blood. And he gives her his shirt. He's got like a suit jacket on or something. And uh, that's weird. First of all, what sane woman who lives in a city goes into a confined, locked space with a man she doesn't know? And second, who, who starts change, changing clothing with a complete stranger? Like, the, it's just bizarre. It's just a weird thing to do. Um, and it's meant to, I think, illustrate this sort of immediate attraction or bond that these two people have with one another, and also to demonstrate that Jeremy, who is the, the main character's love interest, also the husband of the not deceased but incapacitated author, um, Anyway, it's meant to demonstrate that he's this really nice guy. Uh, to me, it was just really weird. Uh, people don't act that way, and if they do, you stay away from them because they're generally dangerous. <laughs> anyway, so that, it struck me as odd. Um, I, I cannot think of a single woman I know that lives in a city that would behave that way or put themselves knowingly in that situation on purpose. Um, anyway, so she goes to this meeting in this man's shirt rather than walking home and getting a new shirt. Um, she, she goes to this meeting in this dude's shirt, way oversized, does not fit her. Um, her agent comments on her attire and she plays it off as a fashion statement rather than just telling him what happened, which is weird. Um, they go into this meeting and who is to show up, but just gave you my shirt guy. So she's been pulled into this meeting. She doesn't know why her agent hooked it up and they make her sign an NDA, non-disclosure agreement, before they'll talk to her about what's going on. So she signs the NDA and they tell her that this author, Verity, I think it's Verity Cooper. It could be Verity Stevens. I think it's Verity Cooper. 
Anyway, this author Verity, which is where the name of the book comes from, um, has been in a tragic accident and cannot finish the series. She's due three more books or she owes them three more books. Anyway, so the main character uh, is offered to finish the last three books in this series of this author she's never read because the author thought they had a similar voice or had a similar writing style. And the husband comes in. It turns out the husband is Verity's husband. And um, there's this instant frizzle of attraction. So they offer her a reasonable amount of money. She's very eager about the money, not so eager about the project. Um, she doesn't think she can fill Verity's shoes. Verity is a an international best-selling author and uh, she just doesn't think that she can step into those shoes. She doesn't think she's got the writing chops for it. Um, she's kind of obscure and unknown and she has a very small but very loyal following. Um, and the husband kind of goes, can I have a moment alone with her? And everybody kind of thinks like he's going to basically say like, this is my wife's passion project. She chose you. Will you please do it? That's not what happens. Uh, everybody leaves the room, the agent and the two people from the publishing house, they all leave the room and they leave her alone again with this Jeremy fellow. And he goes, look, uh, my wife read your work. She really liked it. She thinks you're the person who writes like her of all the people she's read. And oh, by the way, these guys are lowballing you. You can ask for half a million dollars uh, as your advance and it would be just fine. They wouldn't even blame. So the author becomes significantly more tempted because of the significantly more substantial amount of money. I think it was half a million dollars. It went from like a hundred thousand to half a million, which is quite a big jump. Um, and oh, by the way, he wants her to come and stay in this mansion, uh, with he and his wife and his son, because that's where her office is. And that's where all her notes are. And he couldn't make heads or tails of them. So he needs her to come there and sort them out and stay with them. Right? So, uh, she thinks, well, you know, he's really hot because that's an ongoing theme. And, uh, <laughs> and she goes and like agrees to do it. You know, she wasn't going to. And then he's like, well, you can stay with me. Ha ha. And, uh, and yeah, so that, that's the turning point is, is not the ridiculous amount of money, um, for books, by the way, I should mention, she's never read these, the series. Like she has no idea what she's getting into. She's aware of the author, of course, because like Coho, she's incredibly famous in their world. Um, but she's never read them. And, uh, and, and it doesn't occur to her that that's just not a good idea. Um, so, so she's being evicted from her apartment anyway, because her mom just died and she had overbought the apartment because her mom wanted two bedrooms, uh, promising that this inheritance that she was leaving her daughter would cover whatever the back rent was for this oversized apartment in this big city. I think it was New York, but it's, it's, you know, I don't know if it ever mentions the actual city, but it's made, it's played off as New York. Um, anyway, the mom dies and she leaves no inheritance. And, uh, it's kind of a, well, I just wanted you to take care of me. Um, and I didn't think you would, if there wasn't any money coming to you at the end. So, uh, that either says the mom's a piece of shit or the daughter's a piece of shit or both. Um, either way, you know, <laughs> and, um, so basically her mom dies. I think she had cancer. I'm pretty sure it was cancer. So her mom dies and leaves her no money. And she's just like basically out all of this money that she's put forward to care for her mother. Um, and she gets evicted like you do when you don't pay your rent. And, uh, as it turns out, she needs somewhere to go. The advance is going to take a few days to hit her account. So she thinks, oh, okay, well, I'll just put all my stuff in my car, get rid of everything, put my stuff in my car, put it in storage, drive up to this house, spend the gap between now and when the advance hits my account at this house, you know, going through these notes, figure out what I need to do. And then by that time I'll have money. She interviews for an apartment. Um, you know, she gets it secure, but it's not going to be ready for a little while. So she goes up to this house, um, to look through this stuff. The house is creepy. The kid is creepy. And the first thing that Jeremy does is introduce him to Verity. Verity is a vegetable. Uh, she just lays there with her eyes open and her mouth open, drooling on herself. She cannot move. She cannot speak. She can't communicate in any way. There is no sign that she understands what is going on around her or what is being said to her. Um, she's just kind of in this vegetative state. Um, 
I don't know if catatonic is the right word. I'm not a medical professional, but it's kind of played off as, as though she's catatonic, right? So Jeremy sets her up in the master bedroom because uh, he has moved upstairs to be closer to Verity in case she needs him and also to be closer to her son. And at first... Um, we get the impression that the author thinks he's like still sleeping with his wife, even though she's catatonic. Uh, and we realize shortly thereafter that no, he's got a separate bedroom. It's an, it's a spare room now. And as things progress, you learn that this is not a spare room. It was the, the, the bedroom of one of his daughters. Um, so you learn quickly that the couple had twin daughters and a younger son, and that both of the twin daughters have died. Uh, very, very close to each other within, within months of each other. I'm pretty sure it was in months, like six months apart. Um, anyway, and then after that, uh, the mother, Verity, had this car accident and th this family is just beset by tragedy. So she's digging around in this woman's office looking for notes or outlines or something to give her a clue of what Verity intended for these last three books in the series, right? And instead of finding notes, she finds this manuscript. It's like an autobiography. And she starts to read it, even though she knows she shouldn't, even though she knows it's kind of a violation of the, of the woman's privacy, right? And uh, it's this story of her meeting Jeremy and sort of them starting their life together and that sort of thing. And uh, the author, the main character, gets sucked in immediately. You know, they're, they're having this sort of very uh, frisky, very romantic, very sexual relationship. So we get the impression right away that Verity was obsessed with Jeremy, right? In a really unhealthy, dangerous sort of way. Um, when he goes to work, she feels like her heart's been ripped out. He got transferred for a few months for his job, and she feels like her reason for living was gone. Um, that's not healthy by any stretch of the imagination. Eventually they get married, and she realizes she's pregnant, and she's miserable about being pregnant. She doesn't want her really super hot body to go to pot, as she describes it. Like, she doesn't want to get fat, basically, uh, because she doesn't want to be unsexy for Jeremy. Jeremy, on the other hand, is excited. He is thrilled, absolutely over the moon, cannot wait to be a dad. So she decides she's going to have this baby for him because it makes him happy and because she needs him to love her. Um, needs it. Like, on a core level, it is all of her identity is having this man love her. Um, and the closing part in the last chapter that the author reads before she goes to bed at that first night is talking about how Verity, um, is dreading the idea that there could be something in the world that Jeremy would love more than him, her, and, um, that she hates the thing that he would love more than her, i.e. her child. So our main character author is like reading this manuscript and she looks up through this picture window and Jeremy is kind of there uh, on, a, on a chase, kind of lounging next to his wife. His wife's been put outside in a wheelchair to get her a little sun, get her a little fresh air. And uh, I guess he's shirtless or something. Anyway, she's staring at Jeremy and then realizes she's being watched and kind of like shifts her gaze. And Verity's like head is tilted back and she's looking straight through the window. Like, like she's watching this author and the author's like, no no, that can't be right. And she kind of moves around a little bit and Verity's eyes don't move. And it's like, oh, well, maybe her head just kind of fell back, but that's kind of weird. Like it's a really weird position for her to be in just naturally, right? Like it's, it's not a natural position for her neck or her head to have just fallen in, right? Um, anyway, so she gets really unnerved by it and she moves to a different room or she goes to have dinner or she goes to bed or something. And uh, she resolves she's not going to read any more of the manuscript because it's freaking her out. Like, it's making her see things, it's making her think things and feel things that aren't really happening, right? But as we all know, she can't help herself. So the next day, instead of looking for manuscript and plot stuff for the last three books in the series, she uh, goes back to the, the autobiography. She goes back to the existing manuscript and starts reading again. Uh, the daughters are born. Verity has a dream that one of them is going to kill the other one. She only loves one of them. She doesn't like the other baby. Uh, they're twin girls. She loves one, hates the other. Um, and so she tries to kill the baby. 
And I'm not going to go into details on how, because, you know, obviously that's not necessary. Just know that she tries to murder her own child. Um, and the only thing that stops her is Jeremy happens to walk in the room while she's doing this horrible thing. We kind of fast forward to some situations that um, demonstrate that she's a terrible parent. Um, the, the girls are crying. She has like a baby monitor and basically she turns the monitor off so she doesn't have to listen to them cry during the day while Jeremy's at work and she's at home writing. So basically her kids are like needing to be fed and needing attention and needing clean diapers and she's just ignoring them and writing instead. If you're a parent, that's probably harder to read than it was for me. I don't have any kids, so I didn't have a particularly emotional response to the horrible thing she was doing to her children other than obviously it makes her a bad person. But like, I think if I had kids and had that like natural protective instinct towards my own children, I might have related more to this. Uh, part where we're talking about how horrible parent parody is. Um, anyway, so just be aware, like, if you have new babies or you've lost children, this is probably not a great book for you. So the girls start to grow up and one of them winds up being autistic, the one that Verity tried to murder. Um, and she justifies that as, like, basically she thinks the child is evil or something. Um, anyway, she gets pregnant again and she doesn't want it. And Jeremy, again, is over the moon and she winds up having a little boy. She doesn't love her daughters. Well, she hates one and she's kind of meh about the other, but she likes the little boy. The little boy looks just like his daddy and she's absolutely bonkers. Um, so she likes, she likes the boy. His name is Chase. So fast forward a few years, the girls are, you know, young children, but they're, they're grown, they're mobile and stuff. And the little boy is really little. He's like three or four. And the girls go for a sleepover at a friend's house and the uh, one that Verity loves is allergic to peanuts and the girls in the middle of the night, like little girls do, go downstairs to get a snack. This little girl who's desperately allergic to peanuts winds up eating something with peanuts in it. And because they're so young, they panic and they don't know what to do. Um, she has an EpiPen. They just didn't use it because they didn't know what to do. And so basically she doesn't feel good and she goes to sleep. So as somebody who has really severe food allergies, you wouldn't be able to go to sleep. Uh, the pain in your chest is monumental. Um, being suffocated by your own body is an incredibly painful thing. If Coho doesn't have anaphylactic reacting allergies, she wouldn't know that. Um, but basically the, the little girl dies because she gets tired, presumably from lack of oxygen and they go to sleep. And when they wake up, she's, she won't wake up. So Verity, the mother, blames the other daughter for this death. She basically believes that um, the little girl who remains, I think her name's Peyton or Paige or something, uh, the little girl who remains poisoned her sister, must have given her this thing with peanuts in it intentionally. Never mind that the girls are the same age and at the same reading level. Um, in fact, the one who died was a little more advanced than the other and could have read the ingredients herself and could have checked herself if they had been old enough to do so. Fast forward six months and like most relationships where the parents have lost a child, um, their relationship is on the rocks. They're really struggling. Um, Jeremy is withdrawn. Verity is withdrawn. They're not communicating with one another. They're very snappy with one another. They're just really having a hard time. Their sex life is nil. Because we get the impression that Verity is incapable of relating to other human beings on an emotional level, she gets her satisfaction from their relationship and her reinforcement that he loves her from sex right? So without the sex, she feels like Jeremy is falling out of love with her and she is desperate to fix it. She thinks that the remaining daughter is the thing that's in the way. And if she can just get rid of this little girl whom Jeremy is showering his affection on because she just lost her twin, if she can just get rid of this little girl, that her husband will love her again, right? She's not interacting with the child. She's basically ignoring her existence. And Jeremy's like, hey, I've got to, I've got to go to work. I have to go do this thing. But like, oh, I think he's going to grocery, grocery store. Um, but you, you should play with the kids. Like you should take them out. You should take them, you know, down to the, to the lake. They live on a lake. Um, get outside, get some sunshine, spend some time with your children, interact with your children who you are neglecting. Right? So he goes to the store and Verity, um, Chase wants to, because he heard his dad, um, say he wants to, th that she should take the kids to the lake. He wants to go in the canoe. So she puts Chase, the little boy, and the remaining daughter, whose name I think is Peyton, um, into the canoe. 
and she rows out into the middle of the lake, and she tells Chase to hold his breath and then turns the canoe over. These kids don't have floaties. They don't have life vests. Um, and once the canoe is turned over, she basically grabs Chase and swims to shore. She saves her son and leaves her daughter to drown. Um, and the author who's in the house reading this just loses it, basically. Like, Jer there's no way Jeremy could know. Like, he's had all of this tragedy in his life and he's so heartbroken over the loss of his children and then his wife. Um, and basically, his life has been a series of tragedies and all of them almost all of them have been perpetrated by, on him by his wife. Um, the wife has just torn this family apart. And uh, she's kind of contemplating, like, should I tell him? Should I not tell him? Should I tell him? Should I not tell him? And then something else happens. Like, she's in the kitchen and she hears the TV turn on and she goes into the TV room and the only person in the TV is Verity. Or it's the other way around. Like, she's got a program on and the TV turns off. And then she goes into the room and the only person in there is Verity and the remote's sitting on the coffee table. Anyway, so she gets up in this catatonic woman's face and says, I know what you did. I know what you are. And I'm going to tell him. And this woman, uh, Verity, the catatonic woman, pees on herself. And then that night after they put Verity to bed, she basically seduces Jeremy and takes him to bed. And that's when they start sleeping together. So the author reads through the end of the manuscript and, uh, it basically says, if you ever find out about this, if you won't come back to me, if you won't love me, I'll just drive my car into a tree, which is how Verity got into the situation she's in, in the first place. That's what made her um, catatonic, right? That's what, that she's got a head injury or something like that. So the author thinks Verity's driven into a tree on her own, that she did it on purpose. And that is the final nail in the coffin. Hey, editing Effie here. I just realized that I did a really terrible job of explaining this, but basically before this point, there was a bunch of stuff that was happening that was really weird that like led the author to believe that Verity wasn't really catatonic. Like things were moving around the house. Uh, she heard footsteps up and down the stairs and uh, she kind of saw Verity like standing at the top of the stairs watching her in the middle of the night one night. Um, and also she got locked in her room, just randomly somebody like locked her in her room with a lock on the outside of the door um, that was put there because she's got uh, a sleep disorder where she sleepwalks. Um, anyway, so it, it was a lot more clear in the book than I described here, but uh, yeah, thanks. So she decides that she's going to tell Jeremy that Verity is faking it, right? That she thinks that Verity is fine and she's just pretending like she's catatonic to get attention from her husband because based on this manuscript, she's obsessed with Jeremy, right? So she sets a camera up in Verity's room to prove that Verity is not catatonic. And I can't remember what order this happens in, but she catches Verity moving on the camera or getting back into bed or something. She decides to give Jeremy this manuscript um, and show him the, the recording demonstrating that his wife or, or the tape demonstrating that his wife is um, not really catatonic. When Jeremy finally comes to the realization of everything that's happened to him and his family and that it's all been Verity's fault, um, and two, she's been faking her illness to get attention from him. For months, he's been caregiving this vegetable, basically, washing her and dressing her and feeding her and dealing with her, uh, messing herself and throwing up on herself. And all of that has been just to get him to pay attention to her. Um, he loses it and he goes upstairs and he starts to strangle her. And the author's like, whoa, 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 you can't just strangle her. It's going to leave marks. Not don't kill her, but don't get caught, right? So, <laughs> because I guess that's a Colleen Hoover thing. Uh, if you're going to kill somebody, don't get caught. <laughs> so they decide that they're going to kill her in the way that Verity was going to kill her daughter before Jeremy stopped her when the, when the little girl was an infant. And, uh, and they do. And, and they kill her and she dies. And uh, they leave her in bed for the nurse to find in the morning, basically this tragic accident, right? So they go to the funeral and um, as it turns out, Chase, the little boy, had known that his mommy was not really sick the whole time, but he was five. And even though he kept saying things like, oh, mommy said, blah, blah, blah. Mommy and I did this yesterday. Um, 
nobody believes him. They just think that he's a little boy who misses his mother and he's like making up this life together that they that they have together because he's, you know, hanging out in her room playing like his little Game Boy thing. I didn't tell you how old I am, Game Boy. Anyway, he's playing his his personal gaming device, um, laying in bed next to her, you know, hanging out with his mom, even though his mom can't interact. Um, and so the whole time these adults have thought that he was just making it up. Um, turns out he wasn't. His mom actually was talking to him. And uh, instead of being sullen and withdrawn, like Chase just kind of blossoms. And the author and Jeremy and Chase move out of the house. They move away. A few months later, they go back to the house to collect whatever remaining things they have in it before the house is auctioned off because they don't want to live there anymore and they don't want to own the property anymore. It's contaminated, it's poisoned uh, with all of the memories of Verity and the horrible things that she's done. And Chase says, oh, I need to go get my toy. Um, and he runs up to Verity's bedroom. And the author's with him and Jeremy's downstairs getting some stuff out of the basement. And Chase lifts this board in the floor and gets this toy out from under the floorboards. And then he puts the board back and he runs off to play. Now this whole time, the author has seen things happening that she can't explain. There was a situation where Chase got cut with a knife um, that they then couldn't find. And uh, the author had seen the knife but couldn't find it when she called Jeremy back in after after the kid was patched up. And, and all sorts of other things that were like there and then not there or not there and then there. Um, and she realizes that Verity has been hiding things in the floor. So she opens up this panel. And among the knife and other things that, you know, have been disappearing and reappearing and, and just driving the author crazy, uh, which we realize at this point that, that Verity was doing it on purpose to mess with the author for, like, moving in on her husband. Um, she finds this letter in an envelope, and on the front of it is written Jeremy. So she opens this envelope that's not addressed to her and starts to read. And over the course of the letter, Verity's explaining that this manuscript that they've both read and assumed was true was a writing exercise. It was recommended to her by her agent uh, because she was having a hard time getting into the headspace of her villains. All of Verity's books are written from the perspective of the villain, but Verity's a normal human being. She doesn't think like a psychopath. So um, the, the agent recommended write a journal, write about your everyday life, but write about it from the perspective of anything that goes wrong, anything bad that happens to you, you caused it by your actions uh, as sort of a way to help her shift gears mentally and emotionally and get into the right headspace. And all of the time gaps in the manuscript were her books. So she would basically do this exercise for a chapter or two before she would start writing a new book to kind of help her get into the right mental place. Um, and the author is starting to realize, like, oh shit, we've killed this woman, and she may not have actually deserved it. And then at the end of Verity's letter, she's describing how the night that Jeremy found the manuscript on his own in her office and read it and was so furious that he tried to kill her in their bathroom, um... He strangled her until she passed out, put her in their car, drove it into a tree, and then staged the scene to make it look like she had done it herself in the event that anybody ever found the manuscript, because that's exactly what she described. I'll just drive my car into a tree. Um, and sadly for Jeremy, she didn't die. And then it starts talking about how uh, she kind of came around in the hospital and he was standing over her when she started to sort of come to awareness and she was so terrified that he would finish the job. She just acted like she couldn't see or hear him um, and she just never stopped. Basically, she was so afraid that he would finish the job because he wouldn't listen to her that the manuscript was a writing exercise. He didn't understand. He just couldn't fathom that somebody could make all of that that up and that why anybody would write those horrible things about their real life. You know, um, writing horrible things about fiction was one thing, but writing about their real life and the tragedy of their children, he just couldn't wrap his head around it. Um, and she admits in the letter she probably shouldn't have done it, but it was a coping mechanism. It was a way for her to sort of ment mentally and emotionally process the information or distance herself from, from what had happened. Um, 
And so uh, Jeremy's basically tried to kill her twice. And then the third time he succeeded and I can't, and basically Verity's plan was to pretend like she was catatonic long enough for the money that Jeremy had drawn out of their investments to hit their mutual account in order to be paid out to this other author as an advance. She was going to get up, withdraw the money, grab Chase, and make a run for it to save herself from her husband and to get her, her son away from this man who clearly wants to murder her. Um, and that, and that she thought Chase would be better off in a house where the, the surviving parent was not constantly grieving children who were no longer there. Because um, although Verity was sad about the loss of her kids, the real Verity, not the fictional Verity in the autobiography, um, although Verity was sad about the loss of her children, um, you have to move on in order to provide for the child you have left, right? Um, and, and Jeremy just couldn't move on. He was living in the shadow of his daughter's deaths. Um, and so you're kind of left with, is this really what happened? Or is this just another thing that Verity has faked and made up to cast a bad light on her husband, knowing that he would probably eventually figure out what happened and kill her? or that she would run away, get away, and make him look like a monster, basically. Um, you know, is this her last revenge? Is this her last trick? Because this whole time she's been pretending like she's ill and she's really not. Um, and, and it never, and the book never answers it. You never really find out, like, which Verity is real. Is the manuscript the horrible monster who was terrible to her children and killed one of her daughters? You know, is that the real Verity? Or is this terrified, very normal woman who suffered the same tragic series of events that Jeremy did and then suffered at the hands of her husband who wouldn't believe her. Um, you know, wh which one is real? And, and the book never says. So that's basically the plot of the book. Now let's talk about a few things I liked and a few things I didn't. Um, I know a lot of people were not thrilled with the ending of this book. I know that uh, leaving everything sort of nebulous at the end and you don't really know what is real and what isn't and how much of it was imagined and how much of it was uh, manipulation. Um, a lot of people didn't like that it didn't have a final ending, that you didn't get the answers to all the questions that were formed during the book. Um, I kind of liked that it ended that way. I liked leaving it up in the air and not really knowing. Um, I thought that it was the right ending for that sort of book where everything was the whole time sort of, is she, isn't she, did she, didn't she, um, and, and the ending being nebulous in the way that it was felt like the right ending for me. Another thing I experienced kind of while I was reading the book is the way that Colleen Hoover writes sentences, the way she forms paragraphs, uh, her writing style in general, uh, really pulls you in and is very easy to read and very relatable. It's one of those things where the prose don't get in the way of the story. And in this case, the prose enhance the story. The way she chooses to convey ideas really pulls you into the story and really helps you sort of ground yourself in what's going on. Um, I didn't relate to the characters particularly well, but the story itself sucked me in. So after reading it, I get why Colleen Hoover is as popular as she is. I understand why when you go to a store that sells books, there's always like a full shelf display of Coho books. She made a note at the end of this book that this is not her normal writing style. Um, so I don't know that I'll read another one, but uh, yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it. I liked it. I thought it was interesting and entertaining. Didn't like the beginning, really liked the end. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, and of course if you like the way that I present information, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell down below. You can find all of my social media contacts in the description, and of course if you want to keep up with me and the progress I'm making on my current novel, you can do that at effiewritesbooks.com. Thank you so much for watching, have an excellent day, and I'll see you next time.